Okay, look, uh, starting with um, verse 17. Only let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him and which God has called him. This is my rule in all of the churches. Was any one at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was any one at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Never mind. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, brethren, in whatever state each was called, let there let him remain with God. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if you've had this experience or not. One of the fun things about being a Christian is the reaction people have when they find out that you're a Christian. Um, generally speaking, generally speaking, if they're also Christians, right, they, they want to tell, in my, in my experience, they want to tell me about their church, which is great, because I, I, I appreciate that. I love to hear people excited about their own little corner of the kingdom of God. That's wonderful. But um, if they're not Christians... They tend to react one of two ways. Um, some of them just desperately, desperately, desperately want to change the subject, right? They hear you say, well, actually, you know, I, I'm a Christian. And they hear that as roughly the equivalent of, I have this strange rash. Would you like to see it? <laughs> let's, let's talk about my innards. <laughs> there, there, there are people who want to talk about it, which is great. And then there's that subset of people, that small subset of people, that they want to argue with you. They want to fight with you. Um, and inevitably, they bring up all the same objections, right? There's no original arguments here. Again and again and again, as if perhaps you've never heard them. And you might change your mind if only you heard what they had to say. A classic um, in this genre is, is slavery. Right? I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, well, that book you say you, you believe, did you know that that book allows for slavery? <laughs> did you know that not only does it, this is my voice, I've, actually this was what the guy sounded like. <laughs> did you know that not only does it recognize slavery, it actually instructs slaves to be obedient to their masters. If you'd actually read that book you claim to love, Christian, you would know this. Well, actually, I have read the book, as it happens. <laughs> I have read the book a few times, in fact. And it's hard to have this argument without being a, a jerk yourself. In your, in your better moments, in your better moments, you'd like to point out that the Bible, the Bible is an incredibly honest book, and it paints an incredibly honest portrait of humanity, warts and all. Um, to include... Things like, oh, violence, economic exploitation, sexual assault. All these things are in there because all, of, because all of these things happen. Because they all happen. And if you had the opportunity to really get someone to listen, you'd, you'd, you'd tell them that, in fact, the law of Moses sets really strict limits on an institution of slavery that already was widespread in the ancient world. And the effect of the law was to restrict slavery, to put limits on it. You would point out that while the New Testament doesn't specifically forbid, doesn't specifically command everyone to 
launch a slave revolt, it does radically, radically, radically transform the relationship between master and slave to the point that the distinction between the two does not matter. Read the letter of Philemon. It's the whole point of the letter. Philemon was an escaped slave. Excuse me, Onesimus was an escaped slave. Belonged to a guy named Philemon. Paul was sending Onesimus back to Philemon. Paul never told Philemon, set Onesimus free. What he told Philemon was receive Onesimus as a brother in Christ. Well, let me tell you what. If you're receiving a man as your brother in Christ, you don't own him anymore. Doesn't matter what the paperwork says, right? That moreover, the, the influence of the gospel led to the near extinction of, of slavery in at least the Christian parts of Europe for a thousand years, and that when slavery was once again introduced, this time in the New World, it was biblically informed and biblically formed Christians who fought against it and eventually won its abolition. Guys like William Wilberforce in England. But that doesn't serve the argument, and the eyes glaze over, and, and there you go. This passage from 1 Corinthians, I mention all that because this passage that Kurt just read for us from 1 Corinthians, this is the one of the ones that tends to get dragged up in those conversations. Principally because of Paul's admonition in verse 21 that slaves who become Christians shouldn't worry about their slavery. Now, mind you, he does go on there to say that if they can obtain their freedom, obtain it. And so, the whole admonition to every person to lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, verse 20, is reduced to a, a gotcha argument about slavery. And the problem with that is that if that's all we read it for, we miss something much, much bigger here that Paul's trying to tell us. We miss a much more profound message that the Holy Spirit through Paul, I should say, the Holy Spirit through Paul is trying to tell us about the whole of life, but particularly about that part of life that most of us regard as sort of a burden or a curse or a punishment, at least sometimes. And that is the life of our work. What we do in our work. Verse 17, Paul lays down this, this basic principle, right? That let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. And then he goes on in, in verses 18 and 19 to talk about circumcision, which was the physical, uh, the physical sign of belonging to the nation of Israel, at least for men. Um, it was about your birth, your inheritance, your lineage, right? And Paul, in short, he says that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Why? Well, because we know Romans 3, verse 9, Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned. There's no one righteous, not one, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Jew and Gentile alike. Back in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul said that the only solution to that problem of sin, whether you're Jewish or whether you're a Gentile, is the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross, Christ crucified, right? The word of the cross Faith in the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus. Genealogy, in short, might be a fun hobby, but it does not save anyone. Jesus does. Then in verse 20 here, he moves on into the more general category of calling. Our calling. Now in the ancient world, that, that's a big thing, calling. Because that can include things like whether you are Married or single, we talked about that last week. What job you have, which, you know, in the Roman Empire was often hereditary and set by law. If your dad, for example, was a blacksmith, your great-great-grandson is going to be a blacksmith because that's the law. It could be your job, whether you were a slave or a free. But right now, I just want to <coughs> take the opportunity here in the next hour and 15 minutes or so to talk about this, this one area yeah, you think I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about this one area here that's really that applies to most of us. And that is what is it that we do when we 
what, what is it that we're doing with our lives during most of the week? What are we doing in our work? And what does Jesus, what does the gospel have to say about it? This is part of, uh, we've been preaching here the last month or so, talking about the, 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 the radical nature of the gospel, right? How the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, and the whole story surrounding it, how that good news radically transforms every aspect of human life. And I would suggest to you here, and Paul's suggesting to you here, that it goes on to, to transform even things as mundane as how you make the money to buy your food. What kind of job you have, whether you have a job, where your real work is. This is a great example because Paul here, um, he he's, has some things to say that, that really address challenges that we face all the time. I'll give you a few examples. First, first thing that you, you notice here, and this is really, really important, and here I'm just going to take a second here and speak to guys because this tends to be more a problem for men, although it's a problem for women too. It's important to hear this, and that is that the gospel of Jesus Christ insists that your worth is not defined by your work. Your worth is not defined by your work, by your title, by your income, or conversely, by your lack of work or a title or income. Your worth is defined by the blood of Jesus and nothing else. Nothing else. Verse 23, Paul reminds us, he says, you were bought with a price. You are not your own. Again, I say that to, 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 especially to men, because especially men, we get wrapped up in work, and we tend to we tend to gauge our, like I said, we tend to gauge our own worth on whether we think our work is important or prestigious or whether it seems to, to be making a difference. Women, you do this too, but it's a, a little different. Your worth is not determined by the kind of work you do. It's determined by the blood of Jesus. Um... This is contrary, directly contrary to the way the world works, because the world measures your importance very directly by things like your income, your title. I mean, look at the people. Who do we value? We value incredibly rich people, <laughs> incredibly famous people, athletes, actors, Right? People who are famous for some, some big achievement. They've won some title, some championship. They've achieved their goals. And this is, how we, this is not how people are valued in the kingdom of God. In, uh, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, a book called The, the Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis. And he writes about a, a, it's a, obviously it's fiction, about a bus ride from hell to heaven. But in, in The Great Divorce, um, C.S. Lewis has his character encounter a glorious queen being paraded through the streets of heaven. And she shines brighter than anybody else, and she's attended by a host of angels, and his question is, who is this woman? And the answer was, it was Mrs. Edith Swit Smith of 13 <laughs> Westminster Street in Swansea, Wales. Housewife. Because that, you know, he said, well, he'd never heard of her. But that doesn't matter. That's not how things work in the kingdom of God. That's not how people are valued in the kingdom. Um, second thing to point out here from 1 Corinthians 7 about the relationship between the gospel and work is that this command to stay in our calling, and I, I say this because you can misunderstand what Paul's getting at here, this command to stay in the calling to which we have been called, the place that we've been assigned, this isn't intended to imprison us. 
in a job. It's intended to liberate us. It's intended to free us from always feeling like we've got to do something else. To free us from the idea that, boy, if only I could, oh, I hate, you know, I hate my job. I don't, by the way. <laughs> there, okay, let's be honest. There are days, right? <laughs> If only, oh, pastor, if only I could do something valuable for God. Oh, if only I should become, I should quit my job and become a missionary. That way I'd be doing something valuable for the kingdom. Or I should quit my job and, you know, whatever. Verse 20, again, if a slave can gain his or her freedom, go for it. Right? You're not imprisoned here. But don't imagine that that kind of a change, don't imagine that that kind of change is somehow going to elevate your standing in the eyes of God. Uh, measured, you're measured, by, again, by the love of Christ, not by your job. And what that means is that, you know, look, somebody can come to me and say, Pastor, I really want to quit my job and become a missionary. Great. If you are called to that, that's wonderful. That's fine. But don't imagine that that's going to make you a better Christian. Don't imagine that you have to do that in order to be obedient to Jesus. The message of the gospel is that you're no less called where you're at and no less capable of obedience. Now, there is a caveat to that, and that is in case your job is sin. I mean, there are certain jobs that you should leave now. Please, I beg you. <laughs> Example, Paul. Paul had that job. What was Paul's job? Paul's job prior to being converted was to hunt Christians down. That's not good. If you happen to be, oh, I don't know, a professional assassin, stop it. <laughs> if you happen to, there are all kinds of, you can, you can fill in on your own the jobs that you cannot do and be faithful to your calling as a follower of Jesus. But the simple fact is the vast majority of them you can. Some are harder than others. Uh, third thing to, to point out to you here is that God is far, far more concerned with the way you do your job than he is with what job you have. He cares more about the way you work than he does about what your work is. Again, you know, these people come to say, oh, I, I need to quit and I'm going to become a, a pastor or a missionary. Or something. That's great. Look, that's fine. But first, do godly work where you are. That might mean where you're at, sharing the gospel freely, being a light to the world, but it definitely means just doing a good job. Yeah, nobody, nobody glorifies God by shoddy, unprofessional work. Nobody glorifies God by being a terrible employee. Nobody glorifies God by doing a bad job. Be a blessing to your coworkers. Bring a little goodness and beauty and order into the world because those things reflect the glory of God. And here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. Right? Raising children. I mean, I can't, how, how much more important a job is there? Really, seriously. It pays like garbage. I know, it doesn't pay. It costs. <laughs> Most important jobs you pay to do. Seems desperately unfair. But how much more important does it get, right? How about, but it doesn't even have to be that. Um, how about you can put together cardboard boxes to the glory of God? And in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that sometimes that's more necessary. Look, it would be a glorious thing. I want you to pray. Pray that the Lord would raise up faithful, bold, 
preachers and missionaries and evangelists for his kingdom. But I also ask you to pray that the Lord would raise up faithful and bold welders and seamstresses and dog trainers. Because guess what? And I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'll take one more step here. The world is more desperately in need of godly salespeople and machinists and heavy equipment operators than it is in need of more preachers. There are actually plenty of us. Actually, let's be honest, there are too many. Some of us should quit. <laughs> but there are not nearly enough God-fearing and god following, Jesus-proclaiming nurses and, sale, and you know, sales clerks, whatever. I read to the kids, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So the question you ask yourself is not, hey, how, what kind of job can I do to glorify God? The question you've got to ask yourself is, what can I do in my job to glorify him? And one last, uh, one last quick thing to, to point out, because people mistake this, and that is that your station in life, your work, your job, whatever it is, it's not punishment. Work is not punishment. Some work feels like it. Um, I spent an entire summer mixing mortar in a box with a hoe. <laughs> At the end of the summer, I had really weird muscle development. <laughs> I looked strange, like my, my legs were skinny and my neck was real thick, but <laughs> that job felt like punishment. I've done some other things that felt like, yeah, sometimes they feel like punishment, right? But work is not punishment. There was work before sin. The assignment to tend the garden comes before the fall. Work is a participation in the life of God. Right? God is inviting us in a way to work with him um, wherever we're at. Work is, is, is a gift that he's given us to provide, not only for our own needs and the needs of others, but to provide for the needs of his his church, his kingdom, to be witnesses to the Christ, and just to create beauty and order and goodness in imitation of him. So whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever calling you've been called to, wherever you have been assigned, do it to the glory of God. Amen.